What a joyous morning to be in the house of the Lord. Today we're going to look at a story as old as time, a topic that really touches uh, the very core of our faith in every single relationship. That is reconciliation. To set the stage, I want to share a story that many of us might find familiar, either in our own lives or the lives of those we love. Imagine two friends who were once inseparable. They did everything together. They shared everything. They shared life's highs and lows. They laughed. They cried. Supporting each other through thick and thin. And then there was a misunderstanding, a hurtful word. A broken promise. It tears them apart. Years go by, and both are left with a deep longing of the friendship they once had. But they feel the gap is too wide to bridge. Reconciliation is that act of healing what is broken, of mending what is torn apart. But it doesn't happen in a vacuum. It requires something powerful, something divine, something greater than you or I. It requires grace. Grace is the foundation upon which reconciliation is built. It is the unmerited favor that flows from God to us and from us to each other. We're going to return this morning to the story of Joseph and his brothers. Last week, you may remember that Joseph was betrayed by his brothers. You see, Joseph was his father's favorite child. Any of you think you're your father's favorite child? They had a little bit of proof, though, because Joseph had received this beautiful coat that none of the other brothers had received. And they were so jealous of their brother Joseph that when he came to check on them in the field, the brothers threw him in a pit and allowed him to be sold into slavery. Can you imagine that? If Perry did that to you? No. But that's what happened. And so today we want to hear how the story ends. We're going to read from Genesis 45, 1 through 15, and we'll read that in a moment. But first, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart would be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. I pray, Lord, that you would give us ears to hear and a heart to respond to your words spoken into our lives today. And all God's people said, Amen. So hear now the word of God from Genesis 45, and I'll be reading verses 1 through 15. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all those who stood by him, and he cried out, Send everyone away from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, so dismayed were they at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come, closer to me. And they came closer. And he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. 
He has made me a father to Pharaoh, the lord of all of his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Do not delay. You shall settle in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me. You and your children and your children's children, as well as your flocks, your herds, and all that you have, I will provide for you there since there are five more years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have will not come to poverty. And now your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my own mouth that speaks to you. You must tell my father how greatly I am honored in Egypt and all that you have seen. Hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, while Benjamin wept upon his neck. And he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Joseph, sold into slavery by his own brothers, and his brothers really don't know what happened to him. They don't know if he's dead or alive. And then we have this reunion years later. And when his brothers come to Egypt seeking food, they find before him Joseph. But they were unaware of who he was. Joseph now is in a position to exact revenge. You know, his brothers did, did wrong by him. Can we all agree on that? They treated him badly. And here he is over everything, over the very food they need to eat, and he could have gotten his pound of flesh. He could have exacted revenge on his brothers. He could have gotten even. But what did he do instead? He reveals himself to them, not with anger, but with tears and forgiveness. Joseph's act of grace is profound. He doesn't j just forgive them. He reassures them, and here's what he says. It was not you who sent me here, but God. This is grace that goes beyond forgiveness. It's grace that reconciles, grace that heals and restores relationships. Joseph's story is a powerful illustration of God's prevenient grace. That's a big word that means God's grace that goes before us. His grace is already there, whether we know it or not. This is an example of God's justifying grace. That's the grace that restores us to right relationship with God and with each other. In Joseph, we see the power of grace to turn what was meant for harm into something that is good. Grace has the power to heal wounds, to close the gap in broken relationships, and to restore what has been lost. But that's not all grace can do. Grace flows both ways. We continue our story with another from Matthew's Gospel. This is from Matthew 15. I'll be reading 21 and 28, where we encounter a Canaanite woman. Jesus left that place, went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon, and just then a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. And he answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dog. But she said, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And then Jesus answered her, woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed 
instantly. This, too, is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This woman, a Gentile, comes to Jesus seeking healing for her daughter. And at first, I'll tell you that when you first read that, Jesus' response seems harsh. I don't really fully understand it. Those aren't the words we're accustomed to hearing. I read that to say that he had a mission and this wasn't his mission. But she is persistent. Her faith is unwavering. And she says, yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And he was humbled by that response. He was moved by that response. This encounter is remarkable because it reveals the depth of this woman's faith and the inclusive nature of God's grace. Jesus is moved by her persistence, so he heals her daughter, showing that God's grace is not limited by ethnicity, by social status, by background, by anything. God's grace has the ability to break down barriers. It unites the divided. It fosters reconciliation between those who are estranged. And just as Jesus extended grace to the Canaanite woman, we are called to extend grace to others, to all people, regardless of the differences that may separate us. Can you hear me, Democrats? Can you hear me, Republicans? Can you hear me, Independents? Remember whose we are. We are children of God. Let that flavor our conversations, our interactions, even with people with whom we disagree. God's grace is available to all. And it invites us into a reconciled relationship with God and with each other. So church, what does this mean for us today? How can we, like Joseph, extend grace to those who have wronged us, to those who have betrayed us, to those who have hurt us? How can we, like the Canaanite woman, embrace the grace that God freely offers? First, we need to recognize that reconciliation begins with grace. God's grace toward us and our grace toward others. Now, I've been there. I've been the one that hurt someone. I've been the one who was hurt. And taking that first step of reconciliation is the hardest step. That's where prayer comes in. Begin to pray for the one you've wronged, for the one who's wronged you, and see if God does not change your heart. He will. He will. Ask God to soften your heart, to give us strength, to extend grace even when it's difficult. The next thing we need to do is to seek forgiveness. Whether we've been wronged or whether we've wronged someone else, we need to take that initiative to say we're sorry for our part. Because what I know to be true is when there is discord in a relationship, both had a role in it. It is not one person's fault or the other. Both are responsible. Hear that, brothers and sisters in Christ? We do need to say we're sorry. Those are healing words. Healing words. Remember that reconciliation is not about winning an argument or proving who's right. It's about restoring relationships. And we all want healthy relationships in our lives. And finally, we need to be persistent. Don't ever give up seeking reconciliation and restoration. Like the Canaanite woman never gave up, we too must persist in our efforts to reconcile. 
It may take time, but with God's grace, it is possible. As we close today, I want us to to invite us to think about a relationship in our own lives that may need reconciliation. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's a friend. Maybe it's a coworker. Maybe even somebody in this church. Let's take a moment to pray asking for God's grace to mend what is broken, to heal what is hurt, to reconcile what is estranged. That is our prayer today. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the grace that you have shown us through your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask for the courage to extend the same grace to others to forgive as you have forgiven us and to seek reconciliation in all areas of our lives. Help us to be instruments of your peace, breaking down barriers and building bridges of love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.